process. Our objectives for today are to define SMART goals and identify their key elements. We'll also understand the purpose and the value of a mission statement. We'll identify elements of a SWOT analysis and we'll actually conduct one today for a business venture so you can see an idea of what they're like. Now, why does this matter? SMART goals help when you're on the job to make sure you and your employer are on the same page about your goals and to plan the resources you might need to achieve them. SWOT analysis is a quick way to understand where a business stands in the market, focusing on continuing what it does well and then improving where necessary to remain competitive. A mission statement helps to set forth the vision and the purpose of a business. I like to call it its heart. Moving on from here, let's start with SMART goals. You'll see on the screen a quick overview of SMART goals. While sometimes you'll see some of the wording change just slightly, timely versus time bound, generally these are the key elements you'll see. Uh, these, the research shows that very specific and challenging goals actually lead to better performance. And so SMART goals help to make sure that the goals are more specific, are more challenging. So looking at these key elements, let's start with the idea of being specific. Here, your goal should be as specific as possible. It should answer the W questions, things like what is your goal, um, where will it take place, why are you doing it. The next element is what we call measurable. How will you measure your goal? Measurement will give you the type of specific feedback you need, and it will make sure that you're held accountable or that you're holding others accountable. It also gives you an idea of your progress. Attainable or achievement-oriented goals should push you, but it's important that they're actually achievable goals. Setting goals that really just set you up for failure are not going to be helpful in improving your performance. Realistic goals are important as well. Um, is your goal and your time frame actually practical? And finally, being time-bound. It's really important to make sure there's a time frame to hold you accountable, to improve your motivation, and to really help you with your progress. Let's dive deeper into each of these elements. Under specific, we talked about how you should look at these W questions. You really want to think about who's involved with the goal, what do you want to accomplish, where can you accomplish it, establish a time frame, identify requirements and constraint, and think about the why, specific reasons, purposes, or benefits of accomplishing the goal. That'll help you stay motivated. Um, one example that I like to give for SMART goals is the idea of weight loss. It's a really good way to help illustrate some of these key elements. For example, you could say, I want to lose weight. Well, that means if you lose one pound three years from now, technically, you've completed your goal. Is that really that productive? Not necessarily. So let's think about it being specific. If you're trying to lose weight, you're involved. Okay, what do you want to accomplish? You should think about how much weight actually needs to be lost, which also will help you with our next element of being measurable. You want to think about some of the reasons. Is it for health benefits? Is it because of the way you look? And then you want to think about uh, any kind of requirements and constraints. There are things like eating healthy, maybe joining a gym, some of the financial aspects of that, and whether or not you'll actually be able to do those things. As we move on to the next element, measurement's a really big part of any goal. Here you want to establish concrete criteria for measuring progress toward the attainment of each goal. So you want to think about things like how much, how many, how will I know it's accomplished. It's results you can measure. I used to have a boss that said what gets measured gets done. Um, I like to say what gets measured just gets measured. <laughs> it's important to measure, but you also need to make sure it's useful measurements and you need to actually use them to track your progress and make changes to move forward. For example, um, let's say you decide you want to lose 10 pounds in six months. Okay, that means at the three month point, you should have lost about five pounds. If you get to that point and you've only lost one pound, then you know you need to take what we call corrective action. You need to make changes. So it might be that you need to set aside more time to work out more. It might be changes to your diet and nutrition, but it's very important that you realize that you're kind of off track from your goal and that measurement's what helps you see it really quickly. If you're not at that five pounds at the halfway through, then you know that you need to make some changes. And so that's a good way for you or your boss in the workplace to figure that out too. 
Another example for the workplace that might help you illustrate this concept is the idea of learning Microsoft Excel. You know, you set a goal, I want to learn how to use Microsoft Excel. Well, how does your boss measure that you've actually obtained that? It's difficult. So instead, you want to have a goal that's more specific. You might say instead, I would like to learn how to use pivot tables and pivot charts in Microsoft Excel to improve the way that we look at data in our firm and I hope to learn how to do this within a six month period. Now you've moved from just saying, I wanna learn all of Microsoft Excel, which you, know, you could learn a lot about and your boss could think you failed to do, to being a little more specific about the goal. That'll also help you and your boss have a discussion about how to do the next element, which is making sure it's attainable and how to achieve it. In order to learn to use Microsoft Excel, you might need a couple days off to attend a training. You may need money to attend the training, or you may need some software resources on your computer. When you identify goals that are most important to you, you begin to figure out ways you can actually implement them. So you wanna think about if you've accomplished anything similar. Have you learned to use formulas in Microsoft Excel? Um, have you lost weight before? And think about what conditions have to exist to accomplish that goal. And again, this is a good conversation to have with your employer or if you're a supervisor with an employee, to really make sure that you're setting them up for success and talking about what they need and making sure that you're providing those resources. Another thing to be aware of, I like to make this little joke here, you see on the screen, it says, have you made any New Year's resolutions? And he says, I sure have. I'm going to focus on attainable goals. I'm going to quit smoking. The girl says, quit smoking, but you don't smoke. And you see the guy going, score. Be careful in setting goals. Make sure you set goals that actually improve you in some way. And if you're already not smoking, yes, you've achieved your goal, but have you moved yourself further? Now this seems really silly, but often you'll see people kind of game the system in the workplace by doing just that. Their boss asks them to set up some specific goals for the year, and if you choose a goal of something you already know how to do, I want to do pivot tables, pivot charts, then you're gonna be able to meet your goal without a problem. And so that's not something that's gonna be productive. You know, it's really not being honest with your supervisor. And you wanna think about this not as just helping the organization you work for now. As you build and grow more skills, it will help you be more marketable to other firms and organizations and could improve the efficiency and effectiveness of how you do your work. So let's talk about realistic goals. To be realistic, a goal has to represent an objective towards which you are both willing and able to work. Be sure that every goal will also represent that substantial progress we talked about in our attainable element. Now, think about this in terms of our weight loss example. If you say, I wanna lose 10 pounds in six months, that's probably pretty realistic. You know, people have done that before, and it gives you enough time to lose weight in a way that's actually gonna be okay and healthy to do. If you say, I wanna lose 10 pounds in one month, now that's a stretch. You know, you could be putting yourself in a situation where you're really gaining some unhealthy habits. Is it realistic? Possibly, but is it practical? Is it good for you? No. And so you want to think about that. If you set a goal that's, hey, I'm going to lose 10 pounds in a week, well, now we've gotten to the point where we're just being unrealistic. Setting yourself up to fail is not going to motivate you, and it's not going to improve you on the job. If you say something like, I want to learn how to use pivot tables and pivot charts in Excel by next week, and it's a really busy week at work and you're just not gonna have time for that training, that same goal won't be as realistic. You also wanna think about the time element in your goals. So this is probably the biggest issue I've seen with supervisors helping employees is this idea of adding a time component when they're giving them a task. But you're setting a goal, it needs to have a time component so you know how much time you have to track your progress. You want to think about what the time frame is so you know how much urgency is needed. You know, if it's a month, it might not be as urgent as something that's due the next day. So in our weight loss example, you know, if you want to lose 10 pounds, when do you want to lose it by? It's simply adding that time element. If you run into this issue at work, just ask your boss, you know, when do you want this by? And if they say, you know, I'd like it in a week and you know you can get it to them tomorrow, I always say, under promise, over deliver. You know, even if you think you can get it done in 24 hours, your boss is giving you a week, great. That gives you some extra time, a little bit of a safety net in case anything comes up. 
And it'll also make it look great that you got it in early instead of procrastinating and maybe getting it in too late. If you want a little more information about SMART goals, you'll see another overview available if you YouTube SMART goals quick overview or you can click the link on our Prezi. Regardless if it is professional or personal, we all struggle sometimes to achieve our goals. Many times our struggle is not because of a lack of effort, but rather how our goals have been structured. Anytime you set a goal, or if you find yourself struggling while working towards a goal, keep in mind the word SMART. SMART is an acronym that can be used to help evaluate and add structure to your goals. SMART stands for Specific, Measurable, Actionable, Relevant, and Time Bound. SMART begins with asking yourself the degree to which a goal is specific. This is arguably the most important part of establishing or evaluating a goal. The less specific a goal, the more difficult it is to determine how long the goal should take to complete or how to measure success. Consider the difference between a goal to get healthy versus the goal to lose weight versus the goal to lose 10 pounds. The goal to get healthy is much less specific than a goal to lose 10 pounds. The next question to ask, how is the goal measured? What determines success? Some goals may be best measured by a simple yes or no, such as the goal of climbing to the top of a mountain while other goals are better measured by using metrics such as the goal to lose 10 pounds. The key to measurement is making sure that in whatever way the goal is measured, it accurately reflects success. For instance, if you do not have access to a scale, then measuring weight loss will be difficult and less accurate. An alternative measure may be to track how many inches you have lost around the waist. But to what extent does this accurately reflect the goal? Without access to a reliable way of measuring weight, we may want to consider buying a scale or restructuring our goal. Actionable is not asking yes or no, but how will the goal be achieved? What is our action plan? Do we have the resources and capabilities required to achieve success? If not, what are we lacking? Well-designed goals provide clarity of action. If the actions required to achieve a goal are unclear or there are a large number of actions that need to be taken, we should consider breaking down the main goal into manageable, actionable sub-goals. In isolation, any single goal is relevant, but in life we most often are in the process of pursuing multiple goals. A common issue we face is having too many goals at the same time or pursuing the wrong goals. With this in mind, we need a mechanism to help us monitor our goals to make sure we are pursuing our most relevant goals at any given moment in time. One technique is to place goals in a matrix that looks at effort required versus perceived value of achieving the goal. Not always, but most of the time we will want to focus our energy on low effort, high value goals. Another technique is to use the Pareto Principle, also known as the 80-20 rule. Ask, which are the 20% of goals that will provide me with 80% of my return? The last thing we want to make sure is that goals are time bound. By including a specific date by which a goal should be accomplished, it helps provide incentive and allows us to monitor progress. Consider the difference between the goal to lose 10 pounds and the goal to lose 10 pounds in 10 weeks. Simply by including an element of time, we can now calculate how much we should be losing each week, and if after five weeks we have only lost one pound, we can revisit our action plan. Be wary of any goal that is open-ended, such as the common goal to learn a foreign language. Last, it is important to reinforce that goal setting is not an event. It is an ongoing process of action, evaluation, and revision. It is not about lowering goals or standards to ensure success. It is about recognizing goals are dynamic, because life is dynamic. We do not live in a static world. Life happens. A goal that is relevant today may be irrelevant tomorrow. When using SMART, stay flexible and motivated by setting aside time to reevaluate your goals on a regular basis. Hopefully you found that overview on SMART goals helpful and you will have an activity to help illustrate that concept. We're now going to move forward on to understanding the purpose and value of mission statements. You'll see on the screen a definition from Jeffrey Abrams. This says a mission statement is a declaration of the company's purpose, but it is also a promise the company makes to its customers and also its employees. When we talk about a mission statement, it's an enduring statement of purpose. It distinguishes one firm from another and declares their reason for being. It describes the business purpose, objectives, and approach to reach them, 
Again, it's the heart of the business. Now, the importance of a mission statement. You'll see this little joke on the screen. It says more. That's our new mission statement. While simple, it does tell you that it's a priority to keep moving forward at this organization. So once you determine and define what you and your operations are, you can also determine the ways in which you're the same or different from the competition. This is your strengths and weaknesses as they relate to your vision. So let's take a look at a sample mission statement. Now these are going to differ from organization. Some organizations are going to be more focused on how they're treating their employees, for example, whereas others are going to be more profit focused. I like to give this example of Ben and Jerry's because Ben and Jerry's has three elements to his mission statement. So you'll see a little bit of some of the pieces that can be involved. Let me show you. Underlying the mission of Ben and Jerry's is the determination to seek new and creative ways of addressing all three parts of their mission statement, while also holding a really deep respect for individuals both inside and outside of the organization and the communities that they're a part of. You'll see that reflected in the three parts of their mission statement on the screen. Starting with the social mission for Ben and Jerry's. Their social mission is to operate the company in a way that actively recognizes the central role their business plays in society. You'll see the words innovative methods being used, um, quality of life locally, nationally, and internationally. So here we're seeing some of that creativity they talked about coming into play. We also see that they're aware of the impact they make, both in the local and global community. And so they're saying that we want to do something that recognizes the role and the impact they have and that they're being creative about making sure that's a positive thing. Another element of their mission statement has to focus on their product. Here, they want to talk about having the finest quality all night natural ice cream. Here's a great example of how this business may differ from another. Now, other ice creams may not be as focused on quality. It might be more focused on price. Yes, you get that delicious ice cream, but it might not be as quality ingredients and it might not be as expensive. You know, low price, but still ice cream might be the, what another business focuses on. That's not what Ben and Jerry's is about. You know, you can see on the screen here, they really care about making quality ice cream. They also want to make what they call euphoric concoctions. And I love this example. If you go to the grocery store and you go to buy some cookie dough ice cream, now you can buy that from a number of different providers of ice cream. You know, Hagen does, there'll be a grocery store brand, um, possibly Friendly's, other brands of ice cream that all offer cookie dough ice cream. And while different, it's still cookie dough ice cream. What's neat about Ben and Jerry's, if you've had their ice cream before, is that they do have these concoctions and a lot of them no other competitors even offer. So for example, they offer a type of ice cream called half-baked. You know, that ice cream has that cookie dough piece to it. There's cookie dough in the ice cream, there's some vanilla in there, but it also has some chocolate and some brownie bits in there as well. Now that's something that you're not gonna be able to get from a number of competitors. You know, it might be only Ben and Jerry's or one other option for that. They also care a lot about ingredients and showing respect to the earth and environment and using those ingredients. And that can be important to their customers as well. The last piece of this is the economic mission. Here we see that the company is recognizing it's important to have profitable growth in the organization. That way they're increasing value to their stakeholders. Remember, a stakeholder is anyone benefited or impacted by the business in any way, um, good or bad. And so this includes things like their employees, their customers, and they've actually called out some of, the some of these stakeholders. And not only are they trying to help the investors, shareholders in the business to have more money for it to be more profitable, they're also trying to expand opportunities for de development and growth for their employees. By highlighting the employees in the mission statement, it shows employees are an important part of Ben & Jerry's. Our last topic for today is a really important one. It's a quick, easy tool to help you understand your position in the market. A SWOT analysis is a valuable step to determine how a company has certain strengths, where it might have weak areas, market opportunities, and threats. While it's very simple and quick to do, it does have a lot of value and it helps address critical issues and help a company to be more prepared in using this process. So it's great for you to be able to conduct this sort of analysis. 
So let's take a look further into these elements. The SWOT criteria we talked about, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Now strengths are internal as well as weaknesses. Here we're looking inside the business, whereas opportunities and threats are considered external. That's probably one of the biggest distinctions my students struggle with. Strengths and weaknesses we're looking inside the business. You can think of it as things that the business can control. Opportunities and threats we're looking outside the business to ways to grow the business. And even threats are things you cannot control but can impact the business. So let's learn more about each of these criteria. For strengths, here you want to look at different things. And while you don't need to look at all the questions on the screen, you do want to consider some of them and what the impact is to the business. So a strength could be marketing. You know, they could have a really good ability to market on social media, for example, um, whereas their marketing strategies in other forms might be lacking. There could be strengths in having some innovative practices. Uh, they could be able to offer a product at a low price or have the best quality product. Um, there can be strengths in some of the philosophy and values an organization has, some of their unique selling points. Even a person like you or me could be a strength for an organization if they're really helping the business run well. So you do want to think about what's going well inside that business. And we also want to look at weak areas. You know, and keep in mind, some of these things may overlap. Now, it could be a strength that you have a really innovative process, but it could also be a weakness in that it causes financial difficulty to use that innovative tool. Now, weaknesses, again, are internal things the business can control. So we want to look at things like gaps in capabilities. Now, maybe the organization is really, really good at doing what they do but then they lack some of that financial acumen that will help them to do that better or their marketing experience is lacking. Um, financials are often a weak area, especially for new businesses, as we've talked before about this idea that businesses fail due to lack of cash flow. So unless the company has lots of cash at hand, they're doing very well, they're very profitable, often financials can be a problem. Um, effects on core activities can be a weak area. There can be distractions. Um, often there can be reliability of data issues, which can make it difficult to make strategic recommendations when the data is really not accurate and complete. Processes and systems could be weak. Um, you might have a process that's actually slowing down how the business operates. There could be personnel issues that cause problems, um, deadlines that are causing issues. If you want to think about anything that's really making this business weak on an internal standpoint. You know, this isn't something that we're just looking at, why is this business not doing well, just to complain. You know, here you're identifying what's weak so that you can hopefully take corrective action and improve it. Now remember, strengths and weaks are internal, things the business can really control. We're now moving on to the second two elements, opportunities and threats, which focus more on what's going on outside the business, external business elements. So here we're looking at opportunities uh, it could be a competitor's vulnerability. You know, maybe they're running into an issue with um, being able to make a new product um, as timely as you can. Technology development and innovation. There might be new ways to do what your business is doing faster and better. Um, there could be new markets. There could be target markets that you hadn't thought of before. Um, tactics, um, major contracts that might be big opportunities, partnering with another business. Product development, adding new product services to the menu uh, of the business, volume, production, there can even be opportunities in season and, and trends. You know, for example, if all of a sudden, you know, you work for a clothing store and, and sweatshirts become really popular, hooded sweatshirts, there could be an opportunity there uh, to start providing more hooded sweatshirts that you can really capitalize on. Threats are things that the business can't control, but it's good to be aware of them. You know, the example I like to give is the weather. So if you think about it, if you're, let's say, a movie theater, you know, generally you can expect a similar kind of revenue and you can track how many people are coming in and buying tickets and know what to expect. But when there's a huge snowstorm, are you going to see the same amount of people in that theater as you would when, you know, uh, it's not a snowy day? Or if it's really nice out, you know, more people might be enjoying the outdoor activities rather than being inside. There's not a lot that a theater can do about that. You know, but it's good to be aware of it so you're not going, hey, all winter, 
you know, I don't expect to have any snowstorms, so we can expect high revenues every single day. And it's good to be aware of, hey, some days things might not go so well. Things like the economy um, certainly impact businesses. We've talked about this before in our economics section. You know, here, if people are, unemployment rates are high, people are not employed as often, you know, the businesses are not doing as well, you see less spending going on, and ultimately that can impact sales. Um, new technologies could make your um, product a little more obsolete. You could lose someone who's a, a key staff. Uh, there can also be just other obstacles in terms of legal regulation or even political impact. The legal regulation is a big one because here, as we see changes in the law, it impacts how the business operates. For example, recently they made some changes to the laws that do make some businesses have to post their calories um, of what their actual menu items are on the menu so people can see. So suddenly you're at Cheesecake Factory about to order your favorite meal and you see it's 2,000 calories, you might not be as interested in eating there again. And so that's something that they have to comply with, but it does impact the perception of their customers and could harm their business. So let's try to illustrate SWOT analysis by actually doing one. And to do that, we're going to take a look at General Mills. Here's some examples of strengths you could consider for General Mills. They have a strong market position, and that's primarily driven by their brand portfolio. They have a number of key brands, such as things like Yo Play Yogurt, uh, that really help make, make their business operate well. You know, a lot of people recognize those brands and then will choose those brands because of it. They also focus on nutritious, convenient, and tasty foods. Okay, so that means high quality, people like the way they taste, the fact that it's nutritious can be a strong thing when there's a trend towards healthy eating, it's also good for people, um, and the fact that it's convenient. They also have had great growth in international um, business, which has been driving sales of the company, and that's a strength as well. You know, as they enter into new markets, it certainly helps the revenues of the overall business. Now, a few weak areas that you'll see on the screen. They rely on large retail customers, and that can curtail operational flexibility. So for example, General Mills wants to offer some of its cereal to its customers. They have to go through, generally, a lot of the grocery stores to do that. That means they're relying and it provides some power to a grocery store like Giant or Safeway, um, which presents a little bit of a weak area for them. It would be great if they could find some other channels to provide that product and would not have to be so reliant then on those grocery stores. There's also several instances of product recalls that could hamper the company's brand image. And this is a big problem, especially for other food industry businesses. Because if there is a recall, it can concern the customer about whether or not they're really comfortable with that product. You know, if suddenly you find out, hey, that some of their cereal was recalled because people are getting sick, you might be scared about eating that cereal. It's going to cause a decline in sales. Now, there are opportunities. While rising obesity is not a great thing, it does increase the demand for healthy foods. So General Mills having a lot of healthy products under its portfolio or product mix that does help provide an opportunity for them to grow as a business. There's also a really positive outlook for the yogurt market. It's expected to continue to grow. It's a great trend and they have a strong brand in that market with YoPlay. There's also growth possibilities to remain robust in emerging markets. They've had a lot more sales internationally and they can remain a strong competitor internationally and continue to grow. They can also continue to focus on their food service channel. Now, some of the threats here, um, for food businesses, again, there's a rising cost of raw materials. And if it costs more money for them to create their cereal, then they might have to charge more money to the consumer that the consumer might not be willing to pay for that cereal. So if they can only charge a set price, it costs them more to make the product, they could be losing profits. There's also a lot of competition in that market. You know, if they make a cereal bar, there's a lot of different kinds of protein and cereal bars now on the market. So there's other options for customers to choose from, which also can negatively impact sales. Again, like we talked about earlier, this, this idea of how regulation impacts a business, if there are more food safety regulations, it can make it harder for them to actually get the food onto the grocery shelves for sale. It can be more time consuming, um, more work involved, which is more expensive, which ultimately could threaten their business. So we see very, very quickly 
uh, how that can uh, SWOT analysis can be done with a business, just looking at a few factors in each of those key areas. Now, generally, you want to look at more factors than just two or three to really get a better understanding of a business and its market position. I suggest you try to conduct a SWOT analysis of Chipotle. So I want you to take a moment and think about, pause the video and think about some of the strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities and threats for Chipotle. Hopefully you've had a moment, you've paused the video, and you've tried to do this analysis on your own. Let's think about some of the things that can be strengths then for Chipotle. You'll see that we can do this analysis very, very quickly and still understand a lot more about the business and its position in the market by doing so. So some of the strengths of Chipotle, one of the reasons I use Chipotle for this is because most of my students know them, and that's a strength. Now they have great brand recognition. We'll learn more about the fact that brand recognition means you actually understand what a business is. I say Chipotle, and most of you know that's a restaurant, quick food, Mexican style, and so that's something that's a good thing. You recognize it, whether you go there or not. Usually that means because you recognize it, there could be some preference that you could choose Chipotle over its competitors. And some of you might even have what we call brand insistence. We'll learn those three concepts further in our marketing area, but I do want to mention brand insistence for Chipotle. That means you only go to Chipotle versus its competitors because you're just that loyal to Chipotle as a business. So that's a key strength. Now another key strength, it's a quick option. This is a fast-paced world. They're able to offer you a full meal uh, really in a matter of minutes. Okay, just a few minutes, you're in and out the door. Another strength could be the customization in the menu. Okay, being able to get exactly what you want tailored to your needs, especially with so many diet restrictions. Quality could be another strength. They tend to use suppliers and good local ingredients that help improve the quality of their product. Another strength that could also be a weakness is their menu. They have a very, very small menu that is customizable, but very few options. Now that's a good thing in the restaurant industry. If you have too many options on your menu, you have to have many, many ingredients on hand to make those menu items. As a result of that, if you don't have enough sales, you'll end up actually throwing away, wasting many of those ingredients. That's a cost where you haven't seen any profit driven from those ingredients. By having less items on the menu, only needing a number of items on hand, you'll have less waste going on, which means that you're cutting down the expenses. Now that can also be a weakness. Okay, Chipotle only having a few items on its menu means it might be missing something that leads a customer to go to its competitor. For example, Chipotle used to not have queso, that melted cheese so many customers love. And that was a weakness, because if someone was that dedicated to queso, they're not going to go to Chipotle. You see now Chipotle started offering queso in its stores so that it can compete with it with the other Mexican style grills that are out there. Now some other strengths, um, it could be healthy eating depending on what you eat. Uh, another strength that you might find is that there are many locations available so it's quick and easy access. So we've talked about a number of strengths now. Let's talk about some weaknesses. Um, some of you may have experienced a delay at Chipotle. You go there thinking you're getting quick food and then you're stuck in a long line that's out the door. Now while this is not something that you see every day, every time of the day at every location, because it's still possible, they might miss out on sales for people who just don't have time to risk whether there's gonna be a line to go there. Another weak area could be customer service. Now some of you might say, hey, customer service is great, whereas others often say, no, it's not that great. If you don't have a really high rate where everyone's saying, yeah, that customer service is fantastic, that is a weak area you'd want to be working on. We'll learn more about why the customer is so important to the business. But again, this customer service piece is often a weak area, as there's always areas to improve. Another weak area for this business we talked about expanding its menu, the menu items, because they're such a simple list and they could miss out on customers. Another weak area, they don't have drive through You know, they have competitors and this is supposed to be a fast food kind of a thing. There's some people who struggle to get out of a car, you know, and that might be a convenience thing or it might be a necessity. You have two children in the car that are difficult to get out of their car seats. 
you want to go somewhere where you can drive through conveniently rather than having to take two children out of their car seats to go inside. Another weak area could be the size of their restaurants. Um, atmosphere is a big thing, and if you don't think that's true, think about Starbucks. Now you see people in there hanging out, the music, just kind of the atmosphere it creates. That's something that drives business to Starbucks over other coffee shops. You know, Chipotle, same thing. The atmosphere can be weak in that there might not be enough seating. The seating might not be comfortable enough. It could be loud in there. So you want to think about that for Chipotle. Another weak area, while to shrink, they use local and good quality ingredients. Sometimes that can be a weak area if a smaller supplier that's local runs out of that product. Suddenly they're not able to offer carnitas on their menu. Let's move on and talk about some opportunities for Chipotle. I've had students come out with some really neat ideas here. Now, first of all, they're paying for rent or lo their location no matter what. Now, generally, they're only offering you know, food during the lunch and dinner hours. Offering a late night menu or a breakfast menu can be done with minimal cost and could expand their ability to drive in revenue. Um, drive through is another key area that we've talked about as an opportunity. Uh, another opportunity could be expanding their menu, offering more items, um, things like how they've done with queso. Another opportunity for growth could be to expand the number of locations into new markets. Another opportunity for Chipotle could be to partner with another organization. For example, we see many campuses offer um, restaurants like Chick-fil-A on site on campus for their students, and it'd be great for Chipotle to be able to do the same. They could also do that with some other businesses and business communities. We see now that the food truck industry is growing. Chipotle could use food trucks. They also have an opportunity to dive deeper into the catering industry. While they do offer a catering menu, they could try to market this more as an option for various events. Now some threats facing Chipotle. Things like changes in regulations can certainly impact Chipotle. Um, if there's a product recall, we're going to see issues in terms of how people feel safe about eating their food. And we have actually seen this, which is another reason why I like to use Chipotle. You know, they had an issue with E. coli in one of their locations, turned into a couple more locations, and suddenly they're getting a lot of media attention about how their food's causing people to get sick. Now that really cut down some of the lines at Chipotle as people got concerned about the quality of the food. And so that's something that's definitely a threat to their business. Another threat to Chipotle is its competition. You know, it's very easy for other businesses to enter the market and do something similar. Um, we see this even with pizza. You know, other businesses like Ant Pizza have created the same type of model for a different type of food. Um, and that's something where they're offering another cheap option on the go, which might take away some of the business that Chipotle had. Trends can also impact this. If people start to not really like this type of style Mexican food and they're really focusing more on, hey, only soup and salads for lunch and Chipotle can't accommodate that, that can also be a threat. Hopefully this sample provided you a way to think through how to conduct a SWOT analysis. But I also highly recommend if you're looking at a business like Chipotle, it's very helpful to go online and Google sample SWOT analysis for fast food industry, for restaurants. If you're trying to start a business or you're evaluating a business that you work for, try to look at SWOT analyses that are already out there on the internet so that you can compare and see some of the opportunities they may have recognized and some areas that are strengths maybe your business have as weaknesses and should be working on that can help give you a better understanding of the position in the market for your business or for one that you work for. I really hope you see this value in this really simple tool. It can be very helpful to understand the market position. You do want to do this at any given time. It's not something you would just do once and then never again. It's very helpful if you use it on a regular basis and make changes and corrective action based on it. Today we learned a lot of information about what we just talked about, SWOT analyses, mission statements, and SMART goals, some really big key elements in the business field. I hope you enjoyed learning them and I look forward to teaching you more. Thank you.